Calm down, it's not the end of the world. Today we are continuing our study in the book of 2 Thessalonians and we are jumping in at chapter 2. And if you were going to summarize the whole thing with a simple phrase, that would be it. Calm down, it's not the end of the world. Let's take a look at the first couple of sentences and I'll show you what I mean. Paul begins with this. Now concerning the coming of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed. So there's the calm down bit. He doesn't want them to be worried. Don't be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Now that reference to the day of the Lord is a reference in biblical terms to the end of time, literally the end of the world. So I hope you can see what I mean when I say calm down. It's not the end of the world. This is really what Paul wanted this church to understand. The day of the Lord, judgment on the earth, a time of great tribulation, and the Thessalonians were worried that they were in it. Specifically, they were worried that they had missed this major event that we call the rapture. Paul writes concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him. The rapture is this moment when, when the church on the earth is rapidly snatched out of the planet and gathered to God. That's what we mean by the rapture. And this church was worried they had missed it. Not only that they had missed it, but because they had missed it, that they had ended up in this period of tremendous trial that the Bible also calls the tribulation. And why were they worried? Well, they were worried because they had received what we might call fake news. Paul refers to a letter that they seem to have received that made them think, oh, this is really happening. Now, the challenge for Paul, of course, is that he couldn't just give them a new letter and say, hey, you should really believe this one. Take, take my word for it. This one is the real letter. This is the real news. So instead, what he does is he points them back to things that they were taught by him in person. So they can cross-reference and think about, oh yeah, what did Paul say to us? How can we know if we're living in the time of the end or not? And now he goes on to remind them of the specific things he taught them, and all of this is given for their reassurance. He, he doesn't want them to be troubled. So let's take a, a closer look at what he wants them to know. There are a couple of things in here. Paul goes on to say, let no one deceive you in any way, for that day, the day of the Lord, will not come unless the rebellion comes first. That's the first event. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. That's the second event, this man of lawlessness being revealed. And he's called the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? So two events, the rebellion, we're going to explain what that is, and secondly, the revealing of the man of lawlessness. So let's take a look at this word, the rebellion. I'm going to give us three possible interpretations for this phrase. And the main point I'd like to make to us as we seek to understand the end times better is that all three of these interpretations are possible and all three of the events that we're going to talk about will happen. The only real question is which one does Paul have in mind? So let's take a look. The first possibility we will we'll tease out of here comes from Matthew 24 as the big sort of anchoring cross-referencing phrase in the Bible. And it relates to the falling away of the church. So Jesus says this, then they will deliver you up to tribulation. Jesus is speaking of the end times. They will put, they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and you will be hated by all nations for my namesake. So it's going to be a time of great trial for believers. And then many will fall away. Many believers will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. So this is a big event. This is no small thing. The 
word that, that is leading us to this possible interpretation that Paul uses in the book of Thessalonians is apostasia. And it is the word from which we in English derive the word apostasy. And that means a departure or a falling away. And it typically means a falling away from a belief that you have held previously. And so commentators who hold to this view, and most evangelical commentators or scholars do, believe that Paul, as he talks of the rebellion as a sign that the end is coming, means this great falling away from the Christian faith by believers. And they ground that belief in what Jesus has to say in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, in a similar vein, Paul gives us a bit more of a sense of what this is going to be like. He writes to Timothy, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. So a time is coming when the church will fall away from the truths of God. That is the first possibility that's being referred to here. The apostle, uh, sorry, the, the commentator, he's certainly not an apostle, the commentator Matthew Henry uh, summarizes it this way, speaking of what Paul is saying in the book of Thessalonians of this rebellion, he says, the apostle speaks of some very great apostasy, not only of some converted Jews or Gentiles, but such as should be very general, though gradual, and should give occasion to the revelation of the rise of Antichrist, that man of sin. So we'll come to that soon. So that's the first possibility, the falling away of the church. The second possible interpretation of that word, the rebellion, is a general falling away of humanity from God, of mankind in general. So again, in 2 Timothy, we read this. But understand this, that in the last days, in the end times, there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, meaning nothing can make them happy, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. So, we're hearing about, again, as a sign of the end, there'll be this tremendous decline in human character, this degrading of society, if you like. That is a second possible interpretation of this word, the rebellion that must come. The third possible interpretation is this, is that it is about a specific action by the Antichrist. And again, we'll talk more about him very shortly. But I want to go back to the, the passage just to see how this third interpretation works. So... Here's what it says. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. We've covered that. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. That's the Antichrist, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Now, that last phrase is really what we're talking about here. In this third interpretation, the rebellion is the very act that the Antichrist takes here. He seats himself in the temple of God. So the rebellion and the revealing of the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, are seen as one and the same. So in this reading, Paul is really just elaborating when he says, uh, he talks about the Antichrist doing these things, things. He's saying that is the rebellion. That's the third possibility. So we have these three possible views. The rebellion might be a falling away of the church a falling away of humanity against God more generally, or it might be the desecration of the temple by the Antichrist. And again, all three of these things are going to happen. But perhaps most importantly for our reading of this passage is that Paul was pointing out to the Thessalonians, they're not happening. They weren't happening in their time. And so they could go, oh, okay, we are suffering immense persecution but we are not living in the day of the Lord, this period of judgment. So that's what they needed to know. Now let's look at the second big event that Paul pointed them to. We've already started to touch on it, and it's the revealing of this man of lawlessness, this figure called the Antichrist. And we're going to break this passage up a little bit because there's a lot going on. We're going to look, and I've tried to give us a bit of alliteration here so that we can remember it a bit more easily. We're going to look at his emergence, his evil, and his end. So let's start with his emergence. So Paul says, 
Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him. You know what is restraining the Antichrist now so that he may be revealed in his time. So we're talking about how he emerges, emerges, how he comes to be known, how he is revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is taken out of the way. So we see that there is this incredibly boastful, arrogant man who is going to enter history at some point, but he can't enter yet. He can only enter at a very particular time. We read that he's being restrained. He's being held back and he will only be revealed. He will only emerge until that restrainer is taken out of the way. So who then, of course, the question is, is the restrainer? And a number of different interpretations have been offered over time, but we as a church believe that the restrainer is the Holy Spirit as he is present in the church of God. You see, when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, God's Holy Spirit comes and lives in you. And this body of believers known as the church is this tremendous force for good on the earth. And collectively, together, by our presence, by the things we do, by the things we say, by our teaching, by our involvement and our actions in ministry and society, we help, help, we help to stem the tide of this degradation that we see all around us. And what we believe that this passage is telling us is that one day when God snatches his church up out of the world through this event called the rapture, the Holy Spirit in that way will be removed from the earth and will no longer be present in a way that restrains the coming of the Antichrist. That is the necessary precondition, if you like, for the Antichrist to be revealed. Now, I do want to say, and this is important, that the Holy Spirit will continue to be active on the planet, on the earth, after the church has been removed, because many, many, many people will come to place their faith in Jesus Christ during this time of trial during this time of God's tribulation. But what we believe uh, is being referred to here is that Paul is talking about the rapid exit, exit of the church through the rapture, which removes the restraint that prevents the Antichrist from, from being revealed. So that is what we need to know about his emergence. Now let's talk about his evil. Let's talk about his character. We read this. The coming of the lawless one. Now that's worth noting in itself, right? The lawless one, the one who is himself without restraint, who does whatever he wants, is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So Paul, uh, sorry, Paul tells us that the Antichrist is going to do whatever he wants. He, he elevates himself above everything, above every other religion, and of, of course above the one true God whom we know. He is called the son of destruction. His rule is destructive and he wants to pull down and tear down everything that God is about. And he wants to set himself up in the very temple of God. The, the Lord Jesus talks about this act of desecration, which is also known as the abomination which causes desolation. And the Lord himself, as he refers to that, is referring back further still to the prophet Daniel who wrote about these things. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time to dig into that today. But what we need to see and take from this is that the Antichrist, the one who stands in the place of Christ, is incredibly evil. And his character and his coming will be marked by great deception. He will have this demonic power, this ability to, by the power of Satan, to perform false signs and wonders. He will do things that seem and are indeed miraculous. And with all wicked deception, it says that he will undertake these things for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. You know, the hard message for us to see here as followers of the Lord is that part of God's judgment is that he gives people over eventually when they 
just refuse to believe in him, refuse to believe he exists when they persistently choose pleasure over him, when they choose to go their own way, eventually he gives them over. He says, okay, you can have it your way. And he gives them over to deceptions, which they have essentially already embraced. So that is the evil of the Antichrist. He is a deceiver. He is arrogant. He is boastful. And he wants to take as many people with him as he can to destruction. But that is where we come to now. His destruction. His end. This is the good news. We, we skipped this, but actually it's sitting right in the heart of the passage. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Hallelujah. You see, the Antichrist is going to have this incredible power on the earth, but he is not going to last a heartbeat before the King of Kings. There is this wonderful passage in Isaiah that talks about this magnificent age of peace and prosperity that is going to come when the Lord Jesus returns. And it says this, With righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and get this, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Did you hear the echo of Thessalonians there? The, the fact that the Lord Jesus will destroy the Antichrist with the breath of his coming. It's going to be an incredible thing and it is going to begin, it's going to establish, as I said, this time of immense peace and prosperity on the earth. And I want to just give us another, just a tiny snippet of this. I can't resist. In Zechariah, one of my favorite books of the Bible, it says this, On that day... And now we're talking about the day of the Lord's return. Living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. There is this time of tremendous turmoil coming on the planet. But you know what comes afterwards? This time of tremendous peace. And the Lord will restore Jerusalem, this place that has been downtrodden and desecrated by the Antichrist. It will become the seat of his government on the earth and he will be king over all the earth. Friends, I know there is a tremendous amount in there and I urge you to go and begin exploring these things for yourselves. But I do want to touch on briefly, what does it mean for us right now? Now, we looked at three possible interpretations of that word, the rebellion. And one of them was that it referred to uh, the, the apostasy of believers, of people falling away from the Christian faith. And the question is, well, do we see that now? Because Paul could write to the Thessalonians 2,000 years ago and say, you're not seeing this, therefore the end is not yet. But do we see it now? Well, in the last four weeks, three friends have approached me independently without any prompting for me, without a hint, any knowledge that I was speaking about these things and said, you know what, I'm really troubled by what is being taught in my church or the beliefs that are being held privately by the leaders of my church. And they are deeply troubling things. And I'm not going to go to, into them in detail now, but this is bad, bad news. And at a global level, we see massive rifts in mainstream churches as they depart from the truth of God's word. Could this great apostasy, could this falling away be happening today and in our time? Absolutely. The second possible meaning we looked at for that word, the rebellion, was this great falling away of humanity. And we, we saw this reference to people being lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant. It was such a long list, wasn't it? Abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, lacking self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God. It goes on and on and on. Does that sound like our society today? I feel like I have to say no contest. Absolutely it does. How then do we live 
if these are the times we live in. Because you know what? This is all troubling stuff if I'm really honest with you. This is a hard world to live in. We could be living in a time near the end. And even if it's not, man, it sure looks a lot like it. Even if the end is some time away, this is a hard time to be alive, I think. But God doesn't want us to be troubled. And Paul has some wonderful instructions for us here. The first one that I want to just pin down for us is that we need to be on our guard and guard our minds. Okay? We need to guard our minds. And Paul's advice to this to the Thessalonian church after reminding them of all the things about the end that he'd already told them was this. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. In other words, he's exhorting them to go back to the things they know are true. He's exhorting them to go back to Scripture, to anchor themselves there so that they won't be led astray by the false teaching and the falling away. He doesn't want that to happen for them. Secondly, after guarding our minds, we need to guard our hearts. And the the Lord Jesus Christ talked about taking great care that we wouldn't be deceived by false teaching and false prophets. And he said this though, he, he wanted us to tend to our hearts too, not just our minds. He said, and because lawlessness will be increased, do you notice that word again? The very word we were looking at in our in our discussion of what of what Paul was taking to the Thessalonian church, because lawlessness will be increased in these end times, the love of many will grow cold. So he's talking about the heart here. And remember, he's talking about believers. And as we look at all these terrible things happening in the world around us, our hearts can grow cold, can't they? We can say, Lord, what is going on? And we can be tempted to despair. But you know what? The Lord wants us to tend our hearts. He wants us to pay attention to what is going on for us spiritually and emotionally. And he gives us something to to help us work through this time. He says in Luke chapter uh, chapter 21, I should say, Now when these things begin to take place, these, these things that characterize the end, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Straighten up. You know, we, we spend so much time hunkering over our phones to understand what's going on, on, on in the world, don't we? Or, or looking at what's happening on TV or just looking with our eyes and saying, what is going on? But God wants us to lift out our sights so much higher. He wants us to take a different frame of reference, not just to say, man, look at what's going on in the world and the here and now. He wants us to take an eternal perspective to look much further And to say, do you know what? These things that are happening around you are indicators that the end is coming and not just the judgment on the earth, but your redemption as followers of Jesus Christ. I was meditating on this word of redemption. I thought, Lord, what do you want us to know about this? What is it about redemption? Now, when you redeem something, you go and claim something you've already paid for. And this is God's message for us today. 2,000 years ago, He paid for us on a cross. We were separated from Him by our sins. And God, who loved the world so much, sent His one and only Son to die for us. And soon, dear friends, He is coming to redeem His own. He is coming to collect what He paid for. He is going to snatch us up out of this earth. He is going to gather us to Him. And then one day we will return with him as he establishes his kingdom, as he does away with the Antichrist and he ushers in this incredible kingdom to come. That's what it means when we pray, Lord, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Dear friends, I want us to stand firm. Whether the end is close or far away, we need to stand firm in the faith. We need to guard our hearts. We need to test absolutely everything against the Bible. And dear friends, I ask you, actually, test every word I'm speaking to you today. Every word. Secondly, we need to guard our hearts. We need to tend to them, friends. Otherwise, we will become just as angry and godless as everybody else on this planet. 
And God doesn't want that for us. He wants us to look up, to see that the King of Kings is coming. Our Redeemer is here. The Bible says, when you see these things coming, know that he is right at the door. Can you imagine that? The King is coming. Hamelech Bah.